Gente, Tia Cia. Close your eyes. Roll your shoulders. Let's get started. Nuka, are you okay? You, you look miles away. Because I didn't want to interrupt and I wanted to start with you guys. <laughs> ah, don't be a stranger. Look. Hi, Asma. Hi. Oh, you're not a stranger now. You've got, you've got asthma. <laughs> Let's stay where you are. Okay. So, oh, I just wait for asthma to get ready. It's okay. You can come closer too, though. Yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> Asthma's not. <laughs> right, so this word advertising, one hour to talk about advertising. My God, I've got some clips, but should we start with some basics? What does the word advertise mean? Remember a couple of things here that I want to talk about. 
Um, most of the, this course is actually thinking about media as a verb, not a noun. So I'm more interested in the action, the communicative action of advertising than I am in the intention or even the, the results of advertising. It's a, it's a communicative method. What is advertising? Selling. Does it have to be selling? It's about to convince you of something. It is selling and it is human, but I want to ask a, a slightly, well, what might be a strange question to you, but um, do animals advertise? No, just human beings. Okay, so next time you hear a bird whistling, or singing, rather, yeah, Why is it singing? It might be looking for um, a partner. So it might be, or it might just be happy. With what you just mentioned, I just added, I, immediately when you said a bird singing, I thought advertising may be something like I have a talent or I have a product or I have a thing, showing it off to the world so that it could be in terms of the world could use it, buy the product in, uh, to gain monetary thing, or maybe I just want to show it off to people. So. A beautiful flower. Yeah. Why why is it so beautiful? What's the purpose biologically? To express to express ourselves. To attract mm -hmm. to bring yeah. bees yeah. and insects yeah. that will ca carry the pollen that will ensure, you know, survival and cross pollination and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So advertising, I would argue, is not a, a uniquely uh, human preserve. What makes advertising human is its commerciality and it's the most commercial capitalist aspect of media yes it's it's in completely about making profit it's completely about maximizing audiences it's all it's completely about that um okay so let's start with some obviously we've talked about political economic approaches so the most obvious uh, way to um evaluate advertising is using a political economic analysis. So obviously Frankfurt School quite critical of commercial media and including advertising. Let's start with this basic phrase, which is really important that you try to understand. Capitalist society depends on the regulation of consumption. Production must be ma matched by consumption. Okay, what does this mean? It means that for capitalism to work, you have to create demand. You have to make, do you remember we talked about false needs and true needs? Mm -hmm. From a Marxist perspective, you need to turn false needs into true needs. Mm -hmm. Advertising is what basically stimulates consumption. Right? Without advertising, capitalism doesn't work. Yes, you, there's, there's word of mouth advertising, that, that works, but this is a systematic broadcast almost totalitarian method for getting people to think in a certain way. Now when I say think, let's just, let's complicate it a bit because it, advertising is not just about selling a product or exchange in a marketplace. Advertising is also about selling a lifestyle. Advertising is also about selling the whole ideology of capitalism. Obviously, we can talk about that if there's disagreements and, and so on and so forth later. Um, so, I'm going to use a historical example here. Um, yeah, that's all right. Um, a historical example, Fordism. Now, does anybody, everybody know, has heard of a, a, a Ford car, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So, the first American mass-produced car was a Model T Ford. Now this was between 1908 and 1927. So you'll recall from the first lecture when we talked about the history of broadcast, this was the leading up to, this was the kind of first world war period leading up to the second world war interwar period where propaganda began, yes, and where cinema began. But really advertising did not take off until the middle part of the previous century, i.e. the 1950s onwards. Now, if you look at the image on the right, that is a Model T Ford, and it's an advertisement. It's a promotion. Now, 
to the, linking it with the idea of true and false needs, okay? We can test this with anything that we own as an object, including your phones, including computers and clothes and so on and so forth. Remember that in 1908, cars did not exist, okay? So the point here is that uh, the, the purpose of the ad was to really inform um, consumers, advertising consumers, of the value of the use of a car, because it's a new object, yeah? People were used to using trains, or buses, or trams, or horses, or foot, walking. So, what do you notice about that ad? Anything particular? Does it look strange to you? Well, <laughs> It's very basic, it's got a lot of text. Yeah. And most of that text is telling you about its use value, yeah? what the car is for. It doesn't exactly jump out at you like modern um, ads do, mm. like television ads or colorful ads. So it's much more, in an innocent way, informational or educational. Mm. The early ads were like that. Yeah. So, just to keep this on, yeah, on keep the economic um, point um, clear. When the Model T Ford was uh, mass produced, it was mass produced according to scientific management, which is using an assembly line. So we're talking about, remember, manufacturing consent this time when manufacturing motor cars. Once everybody in the US who could afford a Model T Ford had bought one, then we reach a situation of what's called market saturation. In other words, the demand for the car goes down because everybody has one. What do you think the Ford CEO does when the um, demand for the Model T Ford decreases, when it falls? What, what's the next step economically? Upgrade the model and create needs again for the people yeah. to buy it. Yes, so you basically need to create a new car uh, that is more desirable, that has things that the previous car doesn't, maybe a cheaper car, but at the same time you've also got competitive cars, different car companies starting to compete with Ford, and this is where the market changes, and this is where advertising changes. So you basically, this is what we call niche market advertising, or target market advertising, and what advertisers did was they started to, design, well, what, what um, car manufacturers did, but then advertising helped, is they started to design particular cars for particular segments of the market. Mothers, families, people with lots of money, luxurious cars, sports cars, for mainly for men, I have to say. Um, and this, this was the way that advertising became a way of stimulating demand for new models of good, goods already possessed. This is, a, broadly speaking, what we call post-Fordism. Post-Fordism really took off after the Second World War. And as I've said to you already, let's just scroll down. Uh, this enabled the small batch customized, customized goods to be produced for niche markets. Niche markets means separate small markets. Small batch customized goods are produced for niche markets. Advertisers address consumers as bearers of lifestyle. So this is where we change from use value to sign value, yes, in Marxist terms. Advertising promotes the sign value of goods. Now what do we mean here by sign value? Now this is not a particularly recent ad, but it's certainly different from the previous one. Can you see? Mm -hmm. It's advertising and say it is Benz. Obviously, it's different. How is it different? More fancy. Pardon? Looks more fancy. Fancy? Can you use an academic word? <laughs> I can't. Yeah, it's more organized. Chuck, sure. can we use the word sophisticated? sophisticated. High production values? Um, it's not about information or knowledge. It's about Right. Knowledge. You've noticed that. Yeah. Look at the text. That's it's funny. minimal text. Yeah. It's more about the look, mm -hmm. the image that you, that people think that they will receive when they consume the product. But if you look at the words, it gives, <laughs> gives a clue as to what the advertisers were thinking. 
So obviously you can't read it, it's quite small. So it says that... Men talk about women. Go on. Sports and cars. Women talk about men. Uh, I can't read the word. Inside. 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 Ah. It's unbelievable. Isn't it? <laughs> so, who's the target market? Do you think for this? Both, I think. I think for both men and for men. women. I for think it's more for men, men. who yeah. want to attract women, and it's but it's also for women who are who it's making women it's, it's encouraging women to think men who have this car are more attractive. It's okay. a bit misogynist. It's absolutely misogynist. Yeah. Yes. But that doesn't stop advertising. Don't forget, advertising will shock if it, in order to get sales. So there's no problem offending women, right? Yeah. You see, it's not ethical, it's left brain. Right, so this leads to the marketing concept. So the marketing concept is basically the whole purpose from a pluralist perspective, remember pluralism, mm -hmm. is Advertising is market research. Advertising provides choice, diversity, a democratic range of goods that are open to consumers to choose from. And nobody is forcing a consumer to consume a product. Yeah? Um, advertising provides information for consumers. It's positive, according to pluralists, for the producer and the consumer, what people loosely call a win-win scenario. That's a neutral or a pluralist perspective. Um, so, but of course, there are clearly some very strong negative evaluations, and the, they are as follows. So, um, the Theodore Marcuse, um, Frankfurt, this feels a bit wobbly, but it's not, not gonna break. Um, he talks about false needs, and he talks about commodity fetishism. Does anybody know what the word fetishism means? Yeah. What's a fetish? It's a, like a bit rice. It's a little bit more than that, my friend. It's, it's uncommon or oh, weird desires. Yeah, so a fetish is some kind of addiction that's very irrational that is encouraged by the market. So, let's talk about some safe ones. So, the, the, there are these jokes, just, just to continue the sexist line. Women are addicted to shopping. <laughs> have I offended you yet? No. No. I'll have to try harder. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. I'm so, <laughs> I'm addicted, when, in terms of buying, and I'm, more, I'm this kind of Marxist that guy, apparently. Books. Books, you remember. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, what, where advertising is so successful is it makes you believe, just like religion, I'm going to say, on a deep level, you need this product. That's, you need it. And it's, it, it operates on the same level as drug addiction operates. It operates on an unconscious level. And when I say unconscious, what we're saying here is subliminal. You don't even know the effect that advertising is having. You don't even notice it because it's so deep and unconscious, yeah? So this is what we're talking about. That's the, um, so it, it basically makes us all addicted to consuming, yes? It generates, here's the thing, talking about needs, it generates uh, mental health issues, clearly for poorer people, and it, it suggests to people who are very anxious about, about the fact they don't have enough money to consume, that the only solution is consumption. Yeah, so if you feel anxious, go shopping, buy yourself something, yeah? It's actually working on that level. And when I say causes anxiety, next time you walk into a shop, think about the lighting and the display. It's very bright lights, it's often a kind of overwhelming display of colors, designed to actually make you feel uncomfortable so that by the time you walk out the shop, you will have bought something that makes you feel less anxious. I am not exaggerating. That's advertising. Seriously, think about it. Yeah. Think about it. So, advertising and marketing focus only on needs that can be satisfied through consumption. Again, I'm, I'm say, making this very, um, laborious point that uh, the left brain becomes obsessed with consumption and it leaves out the right brain. 
advertising creates uh, anxiety. And also on a, on a mental health level, on a psychological level, it means that people's positive identity becomes dependent on their ability to consume. Not only does it become dependent on their ability to consume, people think that their look is more important than any other aspect of their person. Because advertising is all about this perfect look. Objectification, isn't it? Narcissism. Yeah? No one is, is immune to this. We all are vulnerable to this. But particularly young people. Because young people are the number one target market, market for advertisers. You are young. You, you, you know, to be cynical, advertising companies are going to make more money from you than they are from older people. So young people are particularly vulnerable to advertising. Um, I haven't shown you a clip. It's a really good clip. Has anyone heard of Mad Men? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you a clip from Mad Men. And this is a clip that links with what I mentioned at the end of last week's lecture when we were talking about news and cigarettes. Um, yes, we're talking about... <laughs> So Mad Men is a very interesting um, series, uh, very successful, uh, about that dramatizes the lives that, are they glamorous? Yeah, maybe. Glamorous lives of, of advertising executives in the 1950s and 60s. And this clip will explain what I mean. Yeah. It's very cleverly written. Yeah. It's very